Well, folks, I did not find it, but I went back to my office and ran off another copy. So, please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 21. Tonight we're looking at verses 26 through 30. The message is entitled, Ephesians, Greeks, Egyptians, and Murder. Acts chapter 21, verses 26 through 30, we're looking at tonight, and uh, trust that we will have some great edification as we look at this. Apparently, someone else has a copy of my message for tonight. I don't know where it went. Uh, <laughs> and that is very strange, because I walked over here at 8 minutes to 7 o'clock. I went up to the balcony, made sure that the streaming, the video streaming, was going fine. I'd already set up everything in the radio room. I walked up here, set down my Bible with everything in it, did a couple of other errands, came back in, and my message is always in the cover of my Bible. My, it has disappeared. But I have it anyway. We're in Acts chapter 21, verses 26 through 30. Then Paul took the men, and the next day purifying himself with them, entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people and the law and this place. And further, brought Greeks also into the temple, and hath polluted this holy place. For they had before seen with him in the city Trophimus and Ephesian, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. And all the city was moved, and the people ran together, and they took Paul, and they drew him out of the temple, and forthwith the doors were shut. And as they went about to kill him, Tidings came unto the chief captain of the band, and that all Jerusalem was in an uproar, who immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down unto them. And when he saw the chief captain and the soldiers, they left beating of Paul. Then the chief captain came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains and demanded who he was and what he had done. Some cried one thing and some another among the multitude, and when he could not know the certainty for the tumult, he commanded him to be carried into the castle. And when he came upon the stairs, so it was that he was born of the soldiers for the violence of the people. For the multitude of the people followed after, crying, Away with him! And as Paul was to be led into the castle, he said unto the chief captain, May I speak unto thee? who said, Canst thou speak Greek? Art not that, that, that Egyptian, which before these days made us an uproar, and led us out into the wilderness four thousand men that were murderers? But Paul said, I am a man which is a Jew of Tarsus, a city of Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city, and I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people, and when he had given him license, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with the hand unto the people. And when there was made a great silence, he spake unto them in the Hebrew tongue, saying, Our gracious Heavenly Father, as we look at your word again tonight, we pray that you will open our understanding, give us light, where there is darkness. Give us insight where there is ignorance. Give us obedience where there is disobedience. Cause us to understand the wisdom with which Paul responded to a very difficult situation. Make us men and women of wisdom who respond when we are faced with crisis times in our lives, when there is the crowd and the tumult, the shouting, the screaming, the unknowing accusations that we might respond in the way in which Paul did and then use it as an opportunity for sharing Christ. Father, we thank you for your word and for its power. We pray for your blessings upon it tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Now you recall that the last time we were in the book of Acts, 
we looked at skewed reports and weaker brethren. And that was all the way back on November 15th because November 22nd was canceled in lieu of the Thanksgiving service over at Marcus Hook. And then last week, November 29th, was the fifth Sunday special film, The Search for Noah's Ark. And let me just pause for a moment and put in a plug for this coming Wednesday evening. As you know, uh, a week and a half ago, I went to a banquet over in East Earl, Pennsylvania. It should only take about an hour and a half to get there. It took me three hours to get there because of the rain and the Philadelphia traffic. But um, it was fantastic. It was a presentation by Ken Ham, who was there in person, talking about the building of a full-size ark at their Creation Museum in Kentucky. And that's why we said in the bulletin this morning, the ark has been found in Kentucky. Uh, it's there. Uh, and it is incredible. And Mr. Ham spoke from the scriptures about the ark, salvation, and the return of Christ. Well, he had done that presentation about two months ago in another location at the Creation Museum itself. And the ark wasn't quite as fully completed as it is now. But nevertheless, I got a copy of the DVD from that time that he made the presentation at the Creation Museum, which includes the message that he preached, which is a fantastic message. Really, really want you folks to hear that. And then the pictures of the construction of the ark and the crews actually working on it. And the ma massive, massive timbers. You can see why it took Noah 120 years to build it. It's a huge boat. And it's opening in July of this year. And I got so excited about it, I bought a lifetime boarding pass, which gives me lifetime access both to the Ark and to the Creation Museum, and also gives access to all of my children. Uh, lifetime boarding. Now, they're going to have to pay for their own spouses and kids. I mean, I can't. <laughs> there, are, there are way too many grandchildren. <laughs> I, I can add a grandchild for $300, but <laughs> they're like, I forget how many, grand I, you know, I really don't even know how many grandchildren I have at this point. <laughs> I don't know who's expecting and who's not. <laughs> and uh, I have some who are in the works right now being adopted. And um, so I'll let their parents take care of it. But at least each one of my kids has lifetime boarding on the ark and lifetime access to the Creation Museum. But you must be here on Wednesday evening. It is fantastic to see what is going on and how God has led them by faith to be able to raise that money, $29 million. You say, well, that's a lot of money. Well, it's nowhere near what the Smithsonian pays for one exhibit. Ken will talk about that, but they put in an exhibit to glorify evolution at the Smithsonian Institute that costs something like $89 million for one exhibit. And this entire thing, because there are so many Christians involved who are donating their time, their energy, their resources, they are able to build that entire boat. It's the length of one and a half football fields and all of the exhibits inside of it and purchase all of the land. They have 800 acres there on one of the very busiest interchanges of two interstate highways in the entire United States within driving distance, one day driving distance of two thirds of the population of the United States. And God provided that for them. So I encourage you, please be here on Wednesday evening. I think you will have a great blessing. And so that brings us back to our text for tonight, Ephesians, Greeks, Egyptians, and murder. And you probably picked up on all of those as we moved through that passage just now. Now, we have to look back. It's been three weeks now since we looked at the passage right before this, which was skewed reports and weaker brethren. Very uh, important for a background for understanding what's going on here in this text. So I'm going to summarize that for you very quickly. The last time we learned some key lessons that set the stage for us tonight. Those were lessons, you recall, that dealt with the law, with deliberate, malicious misinterpretation of our words and actions, and proper leadership response. And we're going to see more of that tonight by the way in which Paul, not only dealing 
with the leaders there at Jerusalem in the church and the proper leadership response they had toward him, but now how Paul properly responds when he is put in a crisis situation of a far different nature. He'd been accused before the leadership of the church in Jerusalem, but now he's being accused before the leadership of the Jews and the leadership of the Romans. It's like moving from the frying pan into the fire. He had handled it appropriately and the leaders in the church handled it appropriately. But now we're in a different situation as we look at the riot that is taking place. You recall the lessons that we learned. Number one was the issue of the Jewish law is still with us today. And that becomes very enhanced and obvious as we see the text tonight with these Jews running around screaming and yelling and carrying on that Paul has polluted the temple and brought Greeks into the temple and uh, he's the one who speaks against the temple and he's the one who speaks against the law and he's the one who speaks against God and he speaks against holy things and oh, he's an awful bad guy. The issue of the Jewish law is still with us today. But we know that the church is not under the law, although we've discussed that nine of the Ten Commandments are repeated in the New Testament, not the Sabbath, but the others are. So the first thing we learned was that the law is not bad. We're not free from the law because it was defective, but because the law had a purpose that the legalists miss. The end of the commandment, what is the result that you're supposed to get from it? Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, the end of the commandment is charity, that's agape love out of a pure heart, and of a good conscience, and of faith unfeigned. If you don't reach those three results, you have a wrong application of the law. The end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart, a good conscience, and faith unfeigned, from which some, having swerved, have turned aside into vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. But we know that the law is good. The law is not bad. The law is not defective. Paul reminds Timothy the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Now tonight we're going to see some people who are mindless. They are zealous to try to defend the law, but they are using it mindlessly. It's not that the law is bad. The law is good if a man use it lawfully. There's a lawful use and there is an unlawful use of the law. We're going to see tonight one of the unlawful uses is a misapplication of the law. Those Jews all running around were very zealous to defend the law, just like the leaders at Jerusalem said, Thou seest, brother, how that we have many Jewish converts here and they're all zealous of the law. So we encourage you to take those who have this vow, just like you do, this Nazarite vow on themselves, and go with them and go through the purification rituals at the temple. That's precisely why Paul had come back to Jerusalem. He was finishing off a Nazarite vow. We've talked about that in detail. Paul said, that's perfectly fine. I'll go with these guys. He took this group of men with him who were also completing their Nazarite vows at the same time that Paul was completing his. He was not violating the law. He was not denying the law. He was fulfilling a vow so that he would not have the judgment of God against him. He'd made it while he was under the law, but just because he got saved did not mean he could therefore annul his vows. Just like Paul explains to the Corinthians, when you get married, suppose you were unsaved. Suppose your husband or your wife was unsaved. Well, at the moment you become a Christian, that does not dissolve the vow that you made to that unsaved person. And Paul says you still remain with them. That's no reason to break your vow. Because if you do, God will judge you. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 makes that very clear. So Paul is fulfilling a vow, bringing it to its end so that he might have the blessing of God to continue moving forward. The law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, that's the sodomites, for men stealers, that's kidnappers, for liars, for perjured persons. We're going to see some liars tonight and some perjured persons. 
And if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. In other words, Paul says, I can't give you a list of everything that would break the law. But the law is not made for a righteous man. If you're in Christ, you are righteous not because of your own deeds. You are righteous because you have the imputed righteousness of Christ. Imputation is the act of God which makes you righteous by faith in Christ. Justification is the act or the declaration of God that you are righteous. Imputation makes you righteous. Justification declares you righteous. You are not righteous by yourself. The law is not made for a righteous man, but you are righteous in Christ. The lawful use of the law versus the unlawful use of the law. Second, the second thing we learned was beware of slanted reports because speakers may have an agenda they're trying to accomplish. Obviously, that was taking place here in Jerusalem, not just when there were those accusing Paul of being out there among the Gentiles and teaching the Gentiles not to do all these things that the law required. Leadership handled it properly. But now we have a situation where there's some maniacs, where there's some people who are definitely opposed to Paul who are not saved people. Remember, they have an agenda, and they will try to use what little facts they have against you by twisting them. The third thing we learned was Paul had nothing to hide. He didn't try to work behind the backs of leadership. He went immediately to the leaders as soon as he returned to Jerusalem. The third thing that we learned was wise leaders let those who are under attack make their presentation before revealing the problems and making their judgment. And that indeed is what the council at Jerusalem did. Fourth, wise leaders find the good and commend those who have done the good for their service. When they heard about what Paul had done after he had made his presentation, it says they glorified the Lord. Fifth, leaders are usually aware of rumors that are going around and should be prepared with a plan to set things straight. It's amazing, um, and we often discuss in our session meetings and sometimes outside of session meetings, the rumors that we've heard going around in the church. <laughs> People, what goes around comes around. Eventually, they'll get back and bite you. Be careful when you spread gossip and rumors because most of those things were started by somebody who has an agenda, somebody who is partly telling the truth and partly making it up, which God calls lying. Remember, the law is not made for a righteous man, but it is made for liars for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. Leaders are usually aware of the rumors that are going around. Then we saw James and the elders stating the blessing and the problem associated with the blessing. Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. That issue of the law is still a big issue when dealing with Jewish converts. You're probably aware that there are Messianic Jews who have Messianic synagogues and who go through all of the rituals of the Old Testament uh, and they call their pastors rabbis and they, they call all kinds of things uh, in there that really we are no longer under but they want to be very much Jewish about it and the funny thing is that most of those congregations are made up of Gentiles who try to be Jewish very strange. I know quite a few of these folks and uh, so many Gentiles, some of my good friends in Alabama of all places. Can you imagine Alabama having a Messianic Jewish synagogue that's composed mostly of Gentiles who are all running around pretending to be Jews? There was a problem at Jerusalem. It was a blessing to have the many new believers, but they came with baggage attached. The Gentiles came with different baggage. Of course, they had rampant fornication, polygamy, meat offered to idols, vegetarianism, and so on. Paul deals with those issues in the epistles to the Corinthians. But the Jews came with the baggage of ritualism, placing themselves not only under the moral law, but under the ceremonial law, and the laws relating to the foreshadowing of Christ, which was typology. You no longer hang on to the mirror. You no longer hang on to the photograph when you have the real thing present. They did not understand grace. They did not understand not being under the law. 
they did not understand that we're motivated by our love for Christ, not by the threat of Mount Sinai. When Paul acts both here in Acts and also as he expresses in Romans and Galatians, he's giving a visible expression of the doctrinal truth that he taught to the Corinthians, a proof that he was a mature believer because Paul was willing to give up his rights for the sake of others and not merely insist on his Christian liberty. And that's where we start tonight in 1 Corinthians 9, 20 and 21. Paul writes and he says, And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews to them that are under the law as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law, to them that are without law as without law, but not being without law to God, but under the law to Christ that I might gain them that are without law. And as Paul showed what we call in modern English, deference. Paul didn't run around and try to steamroller everybody, although he answered very directly, as did Jesus, those who were his adversaries. But those who were weak in the faith, the Apostle Paul showed them deference. Remember, Paul here is fulfilling that Nazarite vow, and. He's trying to fulfill what we see in Ecclesiastes 5. I mentioned a moment ago, when thou vowest to vow unto God, defer not to pay it. For he hath no pleasure in fools. Better that, that which thou hast vowed, uh, pay that which thou hast vowed. Better it is that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Now tonight we want to look at a few important keys to the weaker brother issue. Things we didn't get a chance to look at last time we were together. But there are so many people running around today insisting that they be able to control the church because they are weaker brothers. They say, well, that offends me, or this offends me, or this offends me, and because it offends me, therefore you can't do it because it offends me. And I'm the weaker brother, and the Bible says, you must not offend me because I'm a weaker brother. And as a result, they control and they manipulate the church. So let's look at the important keys to the weaker brother issue. Weaker brothers should not always remain weaker brothers, controlling the church through their carnal immaturity. There are some very clear instructions about how the church is to treat weaker brothers, and there are four general areas that we need to deal with. This is new material tonight, and I hope you take some notes on it, because the issue of the weaker brother is always going to be with the church. There are always going to be new people trusting Christ who are weaker brothers. First, Spiritually weaker brothers are, in fact, real brothers. But they should not be included in questionable discussions and issues where the scripture may not be clear. In other words, areas where church leadership may still be working out the practical application of various lifestyle principles and how they apply to current issues. Basic human issues are exactly the same as they were from the beginning after Adam's fall all the way through Israel and the Old Testament, all the way through the beginnings of the church and all the way down to the present. But the applications are different. Let me give you an illustration. When Israel became a nation, they needed a language. They wanted to go back to modern, uh, back to ancient Hebrew as the root language so that Hebrew would be, in fact, the language spoken by the people. And so back in the end of the 1800s, there was established what was called the Va'ad Halashon, the Academy of the Tongue or the Academy of the Language, by a man by the name of Eliezer ben Yehuda, a prodigious scholar. He wrote a massive dictionary of all the Hebrew language through all the periods of Jewish history with every word that was there. But you know, even within that dictionary and every year all the top scientists in each different field get together and, and they work out new words to publish a dictionary for their particular field of expertise. For example, biophysics. You don't find any biophysics in the Old Testament or discussions of the laws of biophysics. And so what they try to do so that they don't take too many loan words from other languages into the Hebrew language, they go back to the original root forms in Hebrew 
and using words that mean things that are close to the idea that they're trying to get to, they add prefixes and suffixes and change the vowels because you know Hebrew is written in all consonants. And the vowels are those funny little dots that are underneath all the big letters as you look at a Hebrew Bible. And I hope some of you have at least seen a few Hebrew words every now and then. You'll see them on Jewish gravestones, for example. And by doing that, they can tie the ancient Hebrew language into modern Hebrew. And all radio announcers, all television announcers, all newspaper writers, all magazine article writers must use the words that are published by Va'ad HaLashon so that the people are hearing real, genuine Hebrew. But for example, back in the days of Abraham, did they have things like escalators or elevators? No, of course not. But Va'ad HaLashon has taken those ancient words for to go up and made them into forms that will describe an escalator or an elevator. Even the Israeli airline, El Al, means to the going up. <laughs> now, they didn't have airplanes back in the days of Abraham and Lot, or even the days of King David. In fact, they didn't even have them when the Old Testament was closed in the days of Malachi. But they used those words so they retain the Hebrew language. So when we're talking about the first issue related to weaker brothers, they are true brothers. And leadership may be still working out some details, just like Hebrew is working out its language, but those weaker brothers should not be included in the discussions and the issues where the scripture in its application to a current modern situation is not yet clear. I hope you can see the parallel. They definitely should not be consulted in setting church policy, determining church activities, writing church doctrinal statements or other things where their weakness may affect others. You say, where in the world do you get that? All right, Paul says so in Romans 14. Let me give it to you. Him that is weak in the faith receive ye but not to doubtful disputations. <laughs> you see, those are the areas where the stronger brothers are trying to wrestle with the, the specific principles of Scripture so that they can apply them to current situations. Weaker brothers are true brothers. They are to be accepted into the fellowship. But those who are stronger need to understand there are certain things in which the weaker brothers should not be involved. And Paul goes on there in Romans 14 to talk about the issues of vegetarianism versus carnivorous believers. One believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. We that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. But you know, if the weaker brothers never grew up, the entire church would be forced to be vegetarians, wouldn't it? Paul says there's those situations, you don't receive them to the doubtful disputations, and I just gave you illustrations of that. But he says there are some situations where because you are trying to help this one who is a babe in Christ, you're willing to give up some things. That's a sign of maturity. When you're willing to exercise deference, where you're willing to put aside your rights and say, for the sake of my weaker brethren, I will give up some things while they are growing up. Number two, and that is exactly what follows, Stronger Christians should be willing to give up their rights as needed for the sake of brothers so as not to hurt them in their spiritual growth. And that has two parts to it. Two parts to the issue of giving up rights. Number one, failure of strong Christians to show deference to weak Christians is a manifestation of pride, selfishness, and ultimately will destroy the weaker brother. 
That's dangerous. We'll look at a passage about that in a moment. The second thing is the weaker brother is not the one. You need to be able to define who the weaker brother is. A lot of times we end up misdefining who the weaker brother is and end up hurting the weaker brother while giving in to the manipulative brother. The weaker brother is not one who loudly objects to what you are doing. You see, the guy who loudly objects to what you are doing would never be tempted to follow your example. The weaker brother is the one who follows your example, who does what you do, and you're doing it as a matter of Christian liberty. It doesn't affect your conscience. But the weaker brother who follows your example has a conscience that keeps nagging him that what he's doing is wrong. He may never say anything about it, but in the back of his mind, he feels defiled. He sees you, you're doing it, you're, you're the stronger brother and, and you, can, you can do it and so it must be okay. But his conscience keeps telling him, I can't do this. But so and so, he's a Christian and I'm trying to follow his example. And so his conscience is defiled. Your action may in fact be okay under the principles of Christian liberty, but because of the connection that the weaker brother makes in his mind with something in his past, for him it is sin. Paul explains that over in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He gives the longest discussion in chapter 8, but I'll just read you the the verses in chapter 4 and chapter 9 that tie together, and I'll put them all together for you, because Paul, he has a continuum of thought as he writes each of his epistles. And so you'll find things at the beginning of his epistles, in the middle of his epistles, and at the end of his epistles as he develops the thought patterns going through the epistles. First chapter 4, verse 10. We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise. We are weak, but ye are strong. You're honorable, but we are despised. Now, if you remember <laughs> the church at Corinth, it was a carnal church. Paul is sort of speaking tongue in cheek as he writes that verse. Because after the first nine verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, those are verses of commendation, verses 1 through 9. The rest of the epistle, the entire rest of the epistle, deals with problems at Corinth. So by the time we get to chapter 4, Paul is saying, this is how you view yourselves. We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Were they strong? Were they wise? Ye are honorable, but we are despised. In other words, people wake up. Now we get down to chapter 8, beginning in verse 7. Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge the knowledge that it's okay to eat things offered unto idols. For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol. And their conscience being weak is defiled. One of the things that characterizes a weaker brother is a weak conscience. He doesn't yet know which freedoms he has in Christ and which he does not, which things are sinful and which things are not. But he has been involved in a sinful lifestyle before his salvation. He has come out of that. He's rejecting everything that is associated with it. And you as a stronger Christian realize you have freedom to do certain things. But he in his conscience and in his mind associates those things with the evil acts of his past. That's why Paul says, as they see you eating that meat off the idols, there's nothing wrong with it. It does not have idol cooties on it. It's okay. But in context, it may be wrong. And here in this context, he says it's wrong. Take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours. It's your liberty. It's your freedom to eat those things that were offered to idols. Nothing wrong with them. But remember, it might become, verse 9, a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see thee which has knowledge, now you know it's okay. You've got the knowledge. Paul tells them, knowledge puffs you up. 
Be careful. We're supposed to know, we're supposed to learn, we're supposed to have knowledge, but it may be the trigger for pride. If any man see thee which hast knowledge, sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? In other words, the weaker brother is not the one who screams and yells at you. You're sitting down to eat. You're having a nice piece of steak that was offered to an idol. It's no problem for you. And suddenly somebody stands outside, screams and yells, throws rocks at you sitting there in the restaurant at the idol's temple and begins to yell and scream and carry picket signs out front. He is not the weaker brother. He may be an obnoxious brother, but he is not the weaker brother. The weaker brother is the one who walks down the street and he happens to glance in to the restaurant there next to the idol's temple where they're serving the meat that was offered to the idols. And he sees you and you've got this big, juicy steak sitting in front of you. Mm, medium, rare. And oh, does it smell good. <laughs> I'm starting to get hungry. Oh, man. <laughs> and he sees you eating that piece of meat. And he used to worship at that temple. And he used to be involved with the temple prostitutes. And he used to be involved in demonic sacrifice. And he saw demonic manifestations. And he saw the drunken priests. And he saw the orgies. And he saw the horrible things that went on in that temple. And he trusted Christ. And he was free. And he was so excited to get out of that. And now he's trusted Christ. And he's become part of your church. And as he comes to church, he hears you giving your testimony. Perhaps he hears you giving a Bible lesson. Perhaps you talk to him and you encourage him in his faith. You encourage him in his Christian walk. You begin to disciple him. And one day he walks by and sees you in the restaurant associated with the temple. And he says, well, that's the man that's discipling me. That's the woman that's been helping me grow in my faith. And I, I guess it's okay. And so he comes in and sits down, but his conscience is dripping with sweat. That's how Paul defines the weaker brethren. Shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to the idols. He's not standing outside and screaming and yelling and carrying picket signs. He's the one who sees you and copies you. The weaker brother is the one who sees you and copies you. Parents, remember that in relation to your children. Grandparents, remember that in relation to your grandchildren. They are still weak. They are still young. You may feel you have certain rights to do certain things. But they are like little sponges. They are soaking it up. You as parents and grandparents know that you are willing to give up certain things for the sake of your children and grandchildren so that they don't follow your bad example. It should be the same in the church. The weaker brethren is not the one who yells and screams, who points the fingers, who accuses. The weaker brother is the one who copies you, but his conscience is defiled when he does so. And then verse 11, Paul says, And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. There are so many instances where a weaker brother, because a stronger brother insisted on his rights, copies the stronger brother, as a result, gets back into the same sins in which he was involved before his salvation, becomes horribly depressed as the devil begins to mock him and accuse him and other people point the finger at him and say, we thought you were a Christian. And he goes back to his old ways. And he stays out of fellowship until God takes him home. Through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when ye sin so against the brethren. When you insist on your rights and you know that you've got a weaker brother, it says you're sinning against Christ. When you sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. That's why Paul says, to the weak I became as weak, that I might gain the weak. 
Paul was willing to restrict his own rights because he knew he had an obligation to weaker brothers and sisters in Christ. I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. The third major principle that we learn in relation to weaker brethren is this. The stronger brother is not necessarily the one who holds to the strictest interpretation of the law. Now we've got that problem in the book of Acts. That's what we've just seen. And we're going to see very clearly tonight, and you've already seen it because I just read the passage to you, that those who hold to the strongest interpretations of the law, number one, may not be, in fact, weaker brethren. And number two, those who hold, the strong, hold to the strongest interpretation of the law may not, in fact, even be brethren. That's what's happening in the text tonight. Many who think of themselves as stronger brothers are, in fact, the worst examples of Christian maturity because they violate the scripture in ways that they fail to realize. And that's what sets the destruction for the weaker brothers. Let me give you an illustration of that out of Romans. Paul uses the Jews as an illustration, and of course that's what we have in our text tonight. He wants to show them something that their so-called strict interpretation of the law, in fact, is a sham. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God. Okay, so here's the foundation. Jewish. Got it. You rest on the law. Got it. You boast about God, the true God. So you got everything. Not only that, you know his will. Hey, these are people who are not ignorant, they're taught. You approve things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. <laughs> now, if anybody could have claimed that, the Apostle Paul certainly could have. He was a student of Gamaliel, one of the top seven rambons, rabbis, Ramban is what they say in terms of these great ones, that ever lived in all of Jewish history, Gamaliel. He was instructed out of the law. Verse 19, And art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness. <laughs> Remember what Jesus said about that? Talking about the Pharisees, the ones who knew the law. He said, pay no attention to them. They're blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind, both of them are going to fall into a ditch. Oh, you're confident that you're a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes. What have we been talking about? We've been talking about babes in Christ. We've been talking about those who are weak in the faith. We're talking about those who are first starting their Christian walk. And so Paul is using the illustration of the Jews in the Old Testament and their relationship to the law which is, of course, the issue that we're dealing with here in Acts. Acts chapter 21, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth of the law. Remember, there is a righteous use of the law and there is an unrighteous use of the law. Thou, therefore, which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself. In other words, it's not enough to teach somebody else. You've got to preach it and practice it. Not just talk it, but walk it. Thou which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? You know, it doesn't matter how big it is. You're preaching, don't go rob the bank. Then you go into the bank and borrow the teller's pen and put it in your pocket. <laughs> now I know some banks give away pens because they know people walk off with them. But you get the idea doesn't matter how small the thing is you steal. You're teaching somebody else not to steal, but you're excusing it in some little way in your own life. You've broken the law. He goes on. Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Jesus said, if thou looks on a woman to lust after her, thou hast committed adultery in, her, in thy heart. Same thing for a woman looking on a man with lust. Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Hmm. Covetousness is idolatry. The covetous man is an idolater. Says so twice, Colossians 3.5 and Ephesians 5.5. 5. 
you rant and rail against the Roman Catholics because they put garlands of roses at the feet of the statues of Mary. And then you go out and covet a new car. You go out and covet a new whatever. You covet something that belongs to somebody else. and well, Then you end up with envy too, which is another one of those deadly sins that we talked about. Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law dishonorest thou God. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. For circumcision verily profit if thou keep the law, but if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Do you remember what we were talking about in the immediate preceding verses to our text tonight? The Jews who were saved, who were zealous of the law, and said, Paul's running around out there teaching them not to be circumcised. Your people. Paul's writing to the Romans, but they're Jews in the church at Rome. We need to be sure that we're not hypocrites, whereby we're talking one thing and acting exactly contrary, though we think it's a little thing, acting exactly contrary, because it affects the weaker brethren. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not the uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law? You're busy keeping the letter of the law, and you've totally lost the spirit of the law. Fourth point. Being a weaker brother means that you are carnal and not spiritual. You may be basking in the fact right now that you're a weaker brother. And so that makes you feel good because it means that the more mature Christians sort of have to give way to you. You're the one they need to take care of. And so you sort of gloat inside, though you put on a pious face about it. You sort of gloat inside that... <laughs> I know they're giving up things because of me. Oh, dear ones, being a weaker brother is defined as being carnal. Remember that. Being a weaker brother is defined by Scripture as being carnal. And you and I are not to live in a state of carnality. The Apostle Paul explains to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians, end of chapter 2 and beginning of chapter 3, that there are three kinds of people, and only three kinds of people. There is the natural man. The natural man is the man who is not saved. There is the spiritual man. That is the man who is saved and walking in the Spirit, growing in Christ, becoming mature and more mature day by day. And the third and only other category is the carnal man. The carnal man is a man who is saved. He's no longer in that natural man state, but he's not yet in the state of the spiritual man. He's the man who's still an infant. infant. He's still the man who is a baby. He's still the one who needs to grow up. We expect babies to be weak. Weaker brothers need to grow up. But because babies are weak, we show them deference. We treat them gently. We restrict our own rights for their care. We give up things so that they will mature properly. But we expect them to grow up. Christians must not continue in a state of spiritual infancy. Too many weaker brothers have learned to manipulate other Christians by insisting on remaining in the state of spiritual infancy. That is, insisting on having their own way. Regardless of what the Bible says, they want their own way. Oh, I know a married couple right now that is having immense struggles because the wife insists on her own way, and if it's not her way, it's the highway. She insists that her husband must do it her way, or he is going to suffer. 
Dear people, that's carnality. And that's a violation of the Word of God. But there are a lot of people in the church who act the same way, except in relation to a larger body, instead of in relation to their human family, in relation to their spiritual family, the body of Christ. And they try to manipulate the church that way. But listen to what Paul says about it. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He's already talked about the natural man. And he says, verse 1, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. They're in Christ. They're saved, but they're still babies. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. You know, babies drink milk. I think you know that. Milk is good for babies, isn't it? I think we all agree with that. You don't take a baby and the first thing you give him beef jerky to try to somehow gum it down. You know, I hope you didn't anyway. <laughs> You're pretty tough on your babies if you did that. We give them milk and not meat. But we expect them to grow from drinking milk to eating meat. Now, as they get older, they can still drink milk. I mean, some of you enjoy milk. I can't drink milk anymore. But some of you can still drink milk and you enjoy it. And you love to have milk with that hot fudge that you're eating or that chocolate cake or cookies, cookies and milk, you know. Oh, I used to love cookies and milk. <laughs> can't drink it anymore. How about soy milk and cookies? Doesn't sound quite so good, does it? When you grow up, you can still drink milk. And so... Whenever you're at church, you will hear a pastor bring back the old things that you already know, and you'll hear him bringing forth some new things that perhaps you didn't know, which suddenly help you to grow more in Christ. And that's what Paul says here. I fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you are not able to bear it. Neither yet now are you able. You can't bear the meat yet. Why? For ye are yet carnal. Carnal means fleshly. You're walking in the flesh and not in the spirit. You're walking like a natural man, but you have the capacity, which the natural man does not have, you have the capacity for walking in the spirit. For whereas there is envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? That's the background for our text tonight. I hope you learned those four things about the weaker brethren, about those who are the natural man, those who are the spiritual man, and those who are the carnal man. And we saw illustrations of all three of those in these two passages from last time and from this time. Is it really 25 after? I can't believe it. I have 10 more points to go <laughs> in relation to our message tonight. The Ephesians, the Greeks, the Egyptians, and murder. And all we've done is given you some new material as foundation. I mean, I summarize very quickly the things that we talked about before because that's essential to understanding our text tonight. But I gave you these, these illustrations of what it means to be a spiritual Christian because that's what we see with the Apostle Paul as he faces his newest test. At least I'll give you the first lesson. first lesson that we learn out of our text for tonight is sometimes when you do the right thing, it will get you into trouble. If you act like a mature Christian, it may get you into trouble. Did you know that? Acting like a carnal Christian will probably not get you into trouble with the rest of the world because you will look and sound and seem no different from the rest of the world. And so American Christians get along just fine in our rotting, decadent, defiled culture because they don't look any different from the rest of the world around us. But sometimes when you do the right thing, sometimes when you obey God, sometimes when you know that you're doing the will of God and you stand out clearly for the will of God, it will get you into trouble as it did with Paul here. Paul already knew that at some point trouble was going to hit the fan. Paul was a prophet, and all of the prophets on the route back to Jerusalem had made it clear that when he got to Jerusalem, he was going to get into trouble. 
Nevertheless, Paul understood, and you must understand, and I must understand, we must always do the will of God, even if it gets us into trouble. Or as you've often heard me say, do right and leave the results to God. Do right and leave the results to God. But remember, when you do that, and that's what happens to Paul here tonight, the devil's crowd will always try to slander you. The devil's crowd will always try to lie about you. The devil's crowd will always try to trip you up. The devil's crowd will always attack you. The devil's crowd will always try to mess up your life. That's the way it is, people. We live in a fallen world. We live in a world where the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Satan doesn't like it when you do right, because that's what confirms what you're saying with your mouth. Don't worry about it. It doesn't matter when they attack. What matters is what God says. What matters is how he views what you're doing, not what other people view you doing. Now, you have to show deference to the weaker brothers, but you're helping them to grow up. But it doesn't matter what they think about you and say about you. What matters is what God thinks about you and what God says about you. And so you do what is right. You leave the results to God. Well, at least we got through lesson one. But we're going to have to close at that point. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. We pray that you will help us to properly understand what a weaker brother is, properly to define it, properly to realize that we have an obligation to those who are babes in Christ so that we might help them grow spiritually. Not so that we can cater to their carnality, but so that we can help them grow out of carnality and see the freedom that they have by grace in Jesus. Not freedom to do what they want to do, but the strength and the power and the enablement to do what they ought to do by your Holy Spirit. To help them reach spiritual maturity so that they might become men and women of God who are faithful and capable of standing for the faith regardless of the attacks that come. Father, again we thank you for the principles of your word, for its application for the way in which the Apostle Paul not only talked it with his mouth, but how he lived it with his life, even though he knew that he would get into trouble with the devil's crowd as a result. Make us men and women of God who are men and women of principle, men and women of character, men and women of the Word of God, men and women who are thoughtful and consistent in the application of the Word of God, men and women who love the Word of God and who make it central in our lives, who inculcate the Word of God in every action and attitude that we have. Those who have their motivations from the Word of God, those who have their empowerment from the Spirit of God, those who have a deep love for Jesus Christ. For we pray these things in his name. Amen. You know what I just found? I just opened my hymn book. There was my 